we're here today for kind of a host of reasons, but the one major thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about was the Borough Homestead and the restoration of it. Just before we get into that though, how long has it actually been since you guys have seen each other? Uh, it'll be a couple of years. Yeah, a couple yeah. of years. Yeah. What was the last reason? Oh, I would just went to see him to see what he was doing and say hello to him over in his political office. I think it was over in uh, Maroubra. Yeah, so it was... Because, <laughs> man, I goes, it's a hard gig, I think, being a politician. I, I could never do the job. <laughs> so I just wanted to go and say hello and we caught up then. Nice. All right, well, well let's talk about the Borough Homestead then. Um, maybe, Ken, you can actually give us a bit of an overview as to why it's such an important icon um, to Australia? Well, I think mainly because it's been identified with Big Night Oil and uh, as the album cover that I think is still in one of the top 100 Rolling Stone album covers. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't know, it, like the way it happened is I just, I sort of went missing in action. Uh, like I'd come from the business world and the manager, Gary Morris, he was the manager of Big Night Oil and I've known the guys before but just in passing, and I'd gone off bush, disappeared, because I uh, sold up everything and just took off. And when I came back, I think the oils found out that I'd done this trip and Gary asked me to come in and show some photos. And <laughs> they saw this photo and they, they're the ones who chose it. And, and I thought, well, okay. And so we did this album cover and that's sort of where it started. So it's really Peter's fault and the band's fault. <laughs> and then they... Then the funny thing is they said, oh, Ken, can you do some uh, photos uh, for us of the band? And I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And I think we came up with very different photos because I didn't really know what I was meant to be doing. So that's how it all started, really. How did you even stumble on to the homestead in the first place? Why were you taking photos of that specifically? Well, I was just travelling through the countryside and I just loved this. I, I just saw that cottage there. And it was ploughed with all the plough marks, which they don't do anymore because they don't plough anymore, they drill the, the soil. And it just looks so surreal and stark and I just thought, there's a person's dreams. There's a person who's uh, built that house and now their dreams have sort of been ploughed around. And I just thought, to photograph it just seemed like a, to immortalise that dream, you know. So that's, uh, that's really, I just stopped and took it. And sort of funny because years later when we went back there, I went into the town just to look at the, the hut and um, I, I had forgotten where it was. <laughs> and so I went to the tourist office and here it is, Midnight Oil Hut. And it's become a big icon of South Australia with thousands of people going each year. And I thought, okay. So I went out to the property to do some more shots and the farmer came up and, and saw me there. And, I, I said, look, I hope you don't mind me taking a photo. He said, oh, no, ever since that Ken Duncan bloke and Midnight Oil, every man, his, yeah, <laughs> every man and his dog comes here. But, and, I said, up, yeah, and I said, well, uh, actually, I am Ken Duncan. <laughs> and he was very funny. He was, we sort of had a bit of a laugh. So. Oh, good. Lucky you didn't chase off the property with a stick. Uh, they're lovely people out <laughs> in the country, beautiful people. Mm. And so why did you actually choose that shot, Peter? Well, I, I think as Ken says, we had the opportunity to look through at some of the work that he'd been doing when he went bush. And the Diesel album kind of was a bush album in some ways. It was strongly influenced by a, a sort of groundbreaking trip we took to the Western Desert and uh, Arnhem Land to play to Aboriginal communities. And it was really strongly infused with landscape as a consequence, so a lot of the electric sounds of Midnight Oil were replaced by acoustic sounds because we were sitting around the campfires at night, writing songs and working things out in that setting. But it's also an album partly about the way in which cultures live together and interact on the land that they're on. And this particular homestead and what it's been through sums that up pretty well because it's a very gracious, it's almost like an architecturally gracious sort of building. It's simple, but it's got something about it, a presence, but it's not inhabited. You know? So whatever, whatever the stories are, it's quite a common story in Australia for people to essentially take a dream, impose uh, on the landscape a building. It's, 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 it's quite European in some ways. 
and yet the Australian landscape doesn't necessarily welcome that. We've been, I mean, we, we were a band that was kind of interesting because even though we started off playing in Sydney and we played, you know, in the grungiest little clubs here and made a name for ourselves and spent a lot of time playing on the beaches yeah. and then in the suburbs and we really embraced the suburbs. We actually embraced the country because we loved seeing Australia and so quite often if we were driving from A to B, we'd divert and go somewhere else and particularly after that trip that we took. But even before then, we were very interested in what happened. There's another Australia happening outside of you know, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. Absolutely. Um, and that seemed to sum it up as well. So, it, it, and it just works at a very important but basic level. It works as a, as a piece of iconography and a piece of art. I agree. I, we, did you ever expect that now, 20 years later, more than 20 years later, you'd be sitting here talking about that album, that piece of artwork, that homestead. I mean, did you anticipate that it was going to have such an impact on uh, Australia? A absolutely no way. <laughs> you've, just got, you've got no idea what's going to happen when you do these things. And the incredible thing is that I've had the first kind of real, in inverted commas, holiday in my life, which I've just come back from in New Zealand. And we went into this little cafe in a small town in New Zealand and up on the wall, they had album covers, Iggy Pop, David Bowie, The Stones, The Beals. So I didn't start immediately hunting, but there it was. Wow. And I just thought, and I knew I was going to come back and bump into Ken, and I thought, this is just amazing, you know. And I'm standing in the cafe, of course, no one knows, you know, and I'm just kind of quietly proud, really. Yeah. As you would be. Yeah. I, how come you didn't holiday in Australia? Well, I do a lot of holidays in Australia, of a different <laughs> kind. Sure. Done enough, um, I, I'm very fond of the Kiwis, you know, I think that um, they're, they're wonderful people and it's pretty close to here and for people who essentially want to travel outside of the country but want to keep a sense of exactly where we live, it's quite close. And if I go somewhere in Australia, the fact of the matter is that I'm probably going to be recognised and start a conversation, which I'm always really happy to do. But yeah. occasionally it leads to work, <laughs> yeah. and I don't mind that. But uh, I just, you know, this was just an opportunity to get well away, and we wanted to catch up with some friends over there as well. Yeah. Fair enough. So, have you actually been to the the homestead? I have. Yeah, I've been past. When was that? Been past. Yeah. Have you stopped? No, I didn't stop. You didn't. Oh well, we stopped, but you know, just okay. It's all well, right. actually, I heard about them try the problems with the roof. Uh, what's happened? One of the side walls came down and uh, the rocks or the stonework and what happens is once uh, and the roof was threatening to come off and so once a roof comes off a building like that the whole building just starts to implode and so I heard about it and um, through Arlene at the oils office they told me and, and I thought well how are we going to do something about this and the oils had already made a donation but I thought we've got to be able to raise money because the South Australian government was approached to try and protect it, but they said no, it's on someone's private land. And I thought it's a major tourist icon. Surely they could, but they didn't. So in the end, we thought, well, look, we'll raise money and make it happen. So some of the locals down there, I think Bruce Stockman and some of the owners, um, Jody, and they decided to create a fund to raise money. And um, so I thought, how can we make some money? So what we did is we made available a print of the, the new print we shot of the hut and the funds for that are going to help build, uh, restore the building. And so we actually sent that out just recently <laughs> and so we've got a bit, of, we've got some money and already as we speak there's people down there, stonemasons. We, first of all we secured, thanks to the oils chipping in and some other people, we were able to secure the roof so that it would go through the last winter because it, it wouldn't have lasted another winter. And now we've got stonemasons, or they've got stonemasons down there building up the stone wall and repairing it. Not making it a new home, but repairing it as it used to look. So, because through this process we had uh, an offer from um, a big steel company and they said, oh, we'll come in and we'll replace, we'll fix up the whole thing and put a brand new red roof on it. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> mm. And because I had this offer, I thought I should hand it on to the people. Uh, anyhow, I handed on, you know, reluctantly. And they straight away said, no way, we want it restored as it was. So it's happening, but we want to keep the work going and 
and make sure it's finished and also maybe protect a few other buildings because I found another one which is like exactly like uh -oh. the Midnight Oil Hut but another one on, on top of the hill so this one so we found another little icon that's on its way too so uh, so I think if we can raise the money let's protect some of these icons of Australian uh, architecture. What sort of money are we talking about? Well you know like um, this oh ten twenty thousand dollars you know it's like we're able to so far we've raised I think just from the print about six or seven thousand dollars and you know just I'd say that I'd like to get as much as we can and protect as many of these uh, huts down in Burrow there's a few that are still able to be protected uh, and if you do another album we've got another one for the <laughs> I got the other, the son of <laughs> diesel and dust. <laughs> Do you have plans for another album for the reunion tour? It sounds like Ken's got the plans. <laughs> like I, I, yes, I think we need to get him back on doing music. I, I, I'd be there. That's my yeah. selfish desire, of course. <laughs> I'd love to see them back doing music, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah well, you've got a bit of time now. No, I think that'll take your time, wouldn't it? <laughs> I've got a few other things I need to do as well. <laughs> yeah. Look, any, any, anything's possible. Uh, it's never over until. That's right. And I look, uh, and I've said, and I've said to the boys, if the right circumstances come around, and we're in the right place at the right time. Uh, there's no other band I'm going to be singing with. That's right. Damn straight. You and he's got so out. much more material now. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be quiet. He's got so much more material. Eh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You could just be singing about your time in office. No, really. no, no, no. <laughs> I think he's got bigger issues. Uh, yeah, yeah well, so certainly it's happening. So, and I think we should protect some of the places that are a part of our history because, you know, we don't have a long history. We have, yes, an incredible long Indigenous history, uh, which, you know, is f fantastic, but also some of that settlers, we need to protect that. Because I think part of that was about uh, returned soldiers from the war were given properties and something about the Goida line that was... Uh, and it was about climate change even back then, where this man Goida said, why are you giving them land here? It may look fantastic right now, but in years to come, they won't be able to support themselves on such small blocks. I think they were 20 acre blocks or something like that. And so here's these you know, returned soldiers who have given so much for their country. They've come back and they've fought, you know, fought hard over there, and they've come over got themselves a property, a small property, and haven't been able to make it pay. And, and some of those stories, you know, they had to sell their property so the properties could become bigger, so they could actually make a living out of the property. So some of those those uh, huts would probably have a bit of a sad story sometimes too, where people have really battled hard against the odds. Do you know anything about the borough? That, that story? Because there are two huts next to each other, aren't there? And one is the original and the borough is only the 1920s hut? Well, they're, they're, they're doing more research even now, but they believe that the one, that the Midnight Oil Hut, was something to do with a staging station for Cobb & Co. So, in other words, they, where they changed horses and so they you know, the, the, the hut beside it. And so they're trying to find out more about the history of it. Uh, as we speak, but now it's, I think the thing that's really launched it in, everyone goes looking for the Midnight Oil Cut, so that's, it's been renamed. <laughs> it, yeah, well, that's it. You actually, Ken, you have a new book out um, called Life's a Journey, and you actually feature the Borough Homestead and talk about it in the book. Congratulations, beautiful. Oh, well, look, you know, the reason we did that is to try and let people be aware that they can support this thing because um, you know that that's we thought let's show them some of the huts and what they can do because we can make a difference everybody putting a little bit can. how can people donate well I think what we're going to do is launch the print again um, we just launched it once and we're going to probably launch it again soon maybe you guys can promote it in, in one of your articles or something Absolutely. like that it'll be gone going into this issue. And, and we'll put it out there, you know, like every time we sell one of those prints, that puts a couple of hundred dollars straight into the fund. Great. Yeah. All right. And that's what it's all been designed for, right? So at this stage we can say, um, take a look in the next edition of Australian Traveller. Sure. Um, you can buy a copy of the print, maybe you can buy it online. Yeah, yeah, we can give you all those details if you'd like, yeah. If you think about it, when you travel, one of the things that actually makes the travel experience kind of more rewarding after you've done it, 
is understanding the stories. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And the hinterland particularly has got these buildings in them and they've all got stories. Yeah. Now this one happened to end up like, you know, on, fr on front of an album cover, which and it suited the album perfectly, but there's more to it than that. Yeah. Um, so we're strongly, strongly supportive of, of the campaign to, to restore it. And I think that as a nation we do need to value better some of these older buildings. And we had a heritage fund that ran for quite a while, but it was for public buildings. So if you go into a country town now, you'll quite often find that the School of Arts Hall or the old police station or uh, even some of the old churches have been done up and restored. And I occasionally stop and go and have a look at the, at the monuments in the square or yeah. fans of money. Country towns, young men in country towns um, volunteered for the First World War at way higher proportions than young men from the cities and the suburbs. So you really saw these country towns effectively decimated in some ways. Yeah. And then they've got to build them up again. And, and it's, it's a powerful story uh, in our own history. And it's kind of reflected in those buildings when you see them now. And especially if you look at the difference between the sort of houses those people lived in and you know, what gets built nowadays. Come a long way, dot, 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 question mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I'd love to live in a stone house, to tell the truth. Of, you know, it's sort of a, a bygone art in a way. It is. But you know, photos I think really come out of stories and, uh, or meeting people and spending time in a land. And like, really, I'm so glad that we're actually doing this. Uh, we're revisiting that hut because I've been forced now to go in and not just, I've met the farmers and, you know, the current owners and uh, Jody, who's uh, the owner's wife, she's a keen photographer. And so now we've got a photographer on the spot and I've been helping her and she's just put up photos of the restoration. They said, oh, can you come down and do some photos? I said, no, we've got Jodie, man. Jodie, she's more than able. And so Jodie's like the, the, the girl on the spot. And your protege. Yeah, Amazing. Well, well, no, we're having fun, you know. She's great. She's a great photographer. And to me, that's about life, you know, learning from each other. And I was just down there recently. And, you know, I was there in the, the shearing shed and with them shearing. I entered this. I love these people. They're salt of the earth people. And then we went down to the pub and, you know, what a good little pub they've got down there. That's <laughs> you know, quite a funny night. <laughs> so Burrow's the place to be. I love Burrow. And there's so, like, now what I've done, I've found Reggie's hut, another hut, and I've found also, we found this old, old Holden ute rusting out in a paddock that was hidden, and, and Jody found it. And so Jody and I are working on this shot now, this old car in the paddock, and her husband said, oh, why don't we get the forks and lift it up and take it out and move it so it's away from this wall, so he's engaged now, so... We're working on a shot at present where he, you know, the farmer's going to help us move the car where we need it to be. <laughs> and that's probably where it'll stay forever. <laughs> Excellent. So you talk about collaboration. Yeah. How did you guys actually meet? Where did that begin? Well, it's with Gary, wasn't it? Yeah, look, I think um, we met at this stage when yeah. we realised that Ken had been shooting a lot of these landscape shots and a lot of sort of shots of Australia. And as a band, we liked his photos. And then we said, well, look, we like that one, so why don't you come and shoot us as well? Uh, which was slightly different, but it was oh, good. So it was <laughs> and then we did, um, we did a film clip together. Yeah. So we got one film. country together. You yeah. shot the film clip as well? <coughs> oh, no, 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 no. I was doing stills, uh, doing stills, and um, yeah, and I think we're doing Blue Sky Mining, I think we're having Kalgoorlie doing some stuff there but yeah and we uh, the funniest thing is when we had to do they wanted to do a panorama of them live and this is in the day before high iso cameras and everything like this so we're going to shoot a midnight oil concert if you've ever seen a midnight oil concert if you haven't you've missed out on something they are like pulsating <laughs> and the speakers and the volume is just like happening and my wife came with me and she was sitting near the speakers <laughs> and i'm out in a chair in the middle of a uh, Midnight all going off, and this crowd just going off, and I'm up there with this camera with a high ISO film, a thousand ISO film, thinking, what am I doing? But we got a shot, and my wife, she couldn't hear for two days. And, and I'm trying to get her to throw me film or something like this, and if you missed the film, it was just like into the crowd and goodbye. What's next to you? 
Well, I'll probably bump into Ken out there. Um, I think that there's lots of important things happening in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs. The work that Ken and others are doing in communities is incredibly important. So is the work for things like constitutional recognition uh, for Indigenous people in the Constitution. They all go together. So I think the work of, of... This is where we do have to work and walk together. Governments have to. Communities. And the private sector. It's, it's, this, is all, this is all our thing, to do what we can. But, so I'll bump into him out there. I've got connections, as Ken does, with communities in the remote areas. And I'll start to do some work with them. Uh, I've got a book that I've got to get happening and, uh, and sort of try and distill the last however many years of, of activities into a memoir, which I'm really looking forward to doing, actually, after all this mm. time. And then there'll be uh, bits of creative work and political action and maybe even some music. Maybe. Yes. Just got to find some time. Yeah, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, that's such a powerful medium, isn't it? So, just because this is Australian traveller, I have to ask, where are your favourite parts of the country? I want to start with, um, apart from saying that you know, you're know in my bucket list of occupations, but um, part of me is I'm really interested and have loved the continent forever. But sometimes there are favourite places that you don't want to tell people about. So I'm going to keep one of my favourite places a secret. I've got it in for some real estate agents who sort of get hold of those secret places. and then Because I think we've got to walk with a lot of anticipation and respect around the place. And it's actually not just about ticking a spot because it's yeah. really beautiful yeah. or very isolated or whatever. I think we've actually got to... I think that you get more out of that when you develop a relationship that's ongoing. So I've got places that I go back to, which for me have become more and more special. Yeah. They might not be the most spectacular of all, but they're the places that have got meaning. However, are we asking for our favourite place of all? If you can, if you can distill it down to that... Well, yes. I, can, I can give you one of my favourite places, and that okay. is um, the Fink River mm. uh, at uh, Two Mile. And just looking across the start of the Western Max, after the river's been flowing, mm. and either very, very early in the morning or, or late in the evening, we're about an hour and a half to an hour and three quarters west of Alice Springs, and about another hour and a half or two hours to Papania. Uh, nice one. What about you, Ken? Well, I, I can agree with Peter. Uh, what is it? The Eagle song? Call a place paradise and kiss it goodbye. <laughs> You've got to be very careful. And also, sometimes the Indigenous people show you places, not that you may advertise it, but you may uh, out of respect of relationship. So I actually like that area too, because that's where I'm mainly working with Indigenous yeah, kids out there. there. And, um, yeah, and every time I go there, what amazes me is they'll take me to a new spot and I'll think, but why didn't you take me here before? They say, now's the time, you know. And so really I do think connection comes out of relationship to the people and the land. And that's unfortunately with a lot of us these days and even photographers, you know, it's all about shooting postcards. And that's not really experiencing a place. It's like, and I see it all the time. I'll wait days and come back many times to a location. But people will come and they'll be click, click, and they're, not, they're like stealing pictures. You know, they're sort of, and they say, I've been there. No, you haven't been there. You just glance past it. So if you spend time with people in a place, that's where you'll find it is usually your favourite place and that's why I'm really enjoying it out there. I mean, I love all of Australia, uh, but I love it out in the Red Centre. Something's happening out there. I believe there's a huge revival happening in our nation and it's happening in the heart of our nation. And I believe we've got a great future ahead of us. And it's through, I think, the Indigenous people are a really important part of this, getting us connected back to more important issues and realising that there is a spiritual realm, there is something happening, positive, you know, so that's why I've been out there. Well said. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you too, Peter. Yeah, no worries.